so this is my relationship or actually an interview about Jesus Christ. Amen. God has done wonders in my life. God is real. The closer you get, the better it gets. But listen, just use me as a conduit to get to Christ. Get some edification, but don't rely on me. Build your relationship for yourself and you'll truly see that God does love you. It may take time to break through Satan's inner workings that he has done on your mind. But once you do, you will truly feel God's love. So let's get into this interview. Okay, so guys, I decided decided to do a little interview just to edify myself, edify Mason, edify you guys. Whatever comes up in our minds, whatever we want to discuss, whatever is just floating around that needs to be talked about, we will talk about that. Where do you want to start? One of my biggest things is religion versus relationship. The enemy has weaseled his way into absolutely everything, whether it's God's work, connecting with God personally, like building that relationship. Like a lot of the times we could be connected to events, activities, churches. You should be connected to a church. But you should be connected to God first. That should be the relationship you're building instead of building relationships at the church and that's your idol. You mean the institution of the church? Yeah, like sometimes people can idolize a pastor to where that becomes their connection to God. Almost like a conduit. To God, yeah. Yeah, rather than having a direct connection. It's always good to be edified and to be sharpened. You need to be held accountable. You think that time is going to detract from it? <laughs> <laughs> Once you start talking about God, everything tries to <laughs> pop up and distract you. It's interesting because I agree that our relationship directly with Christ should be first. That being said, I think it's easy for us to shape Christ into our own image without the accountability from other Christians and other people who have had relationships with God for a long time and who are also accountable to one another. That's where I think like Christian community is essential for shaping that individual relationship that we have with God. God created man in his image and man is trying to create God in their image. What they want to take from scripture, what they want to add. If they have an issue with something, they'll right. add on top of it. It's doing them a disservice because that's God's word. So if you follow it through and through, like that's when you will feel the relationship. That's when you will build and feel him spiritually. In your experience, where have you seen growth in your personal relationship, but also how has that been influenced by external communities of Christians? When it comes to anything to do with Christianity, it's heavily attacked by everything mm -hmm. because it's God's word. Like it says, this world is under the control of the evil one, and we are God's children. So when it comes to anything religious, expect to be attacked by everything, even religion. There's so many deterring factors. You're wrong, you're this, you're that. And it's just the enemy. Like he's every mm. <laughs> trying to divide, trying to separate. How have you seen that uh, division detract from your development of faith? I don't think it really has, because if you have pure intentions and if you really want to build a relationship with God, it's inevitable. Mm. Like if you just pray, like God, just show me the truth. I want to build a connection. I want the truth. Like, just get rid of the falseness, the distractions. Because when I came to God, I was unaware, and I found a Bible in a back alley, which was a Jehovah Witness Bible, but I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then I came here and met Mormons, and I didn't know. Did you get a chance to read the Book of Mormon and to pray? And so what are your thoughts? Like, for me, I personally, I feel like that's not my truth. And I don't want to be, like, disrespectful in any regard, because if you are promoting Jesus, or if you are pushing that, that is a good thing. But for me, I do believe in the Bible, and for me to, like, deviate or like to jump into anything else is a little much for me. I could be wrong. I could be right, but that's just how I feel. Personally. And I totally understand that. I absolutely get that because you know, we're talking about sacred things here. You do not mess with sacred things. We're talking about the single most important thing in the universe mm -hmm. is our relationship with God and his truth. You mm -hmm. do not tread lightly upon this sort of thing. You need to take it very seriously. But that's also the message is that we need to take this very seriously because there's no easy way out now. There's no going backwards here. And we present a path. And it is my testimony. And I don't say this lightly either. This is a path that leads to Jesus. Stop the cap. <laughs> when it comes to like my internal beliefs, different. Would you say that you have felt the spirit of God as we study together? I have, I definitely have. Like we believe in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and there's power in that. Do you think that if the Book of Mormon was wrong, do you think that we would still feel the spirit of God as we read it? I feel like it is a good add-on, but to put all my eggs in that basket. You're not putting your eggs in the basket of the Book of Mormon. It's not what we're suggesting. Suggesting that uh, we put our eggs in the basket of Jesus. And if the Book of Mormon is a true witness of the Savior, I want as much of the Savior as I can get access to. I believe like what you said, like it is like cheese and crackers, like it does go well with the Bible, and I do believe that, but it also adds on a lot to the Bible. I don't know, it just doesn't sit well. It's it's a, it sounds like you've got a number 
your concerns and because you want to be you know, polite. You're I dedicate two years and like I'm not just going to come over here and disrespect yeah, right. And that's the main thing. I mean, I'm still going to walk with Jesus Christ, but like I'm not going to maybe dip into words like Mormonism. Down the line, I could turn around and be like, hey, those guys were right. But as of now, it's just not something that resonates. I believe it is like cheese and crackers, like it is a great add on. But obviously, I'm going to go with the original thing. Personally, that's just where I stand. And I don't really want to attack people who are working with God. I would rather, in this moment, stick to the original branch. Like the Book of Mormon, it is a great add on, but also to jump into that and be like, this is 100% risky for me personally. We become the branch off. Is that what you're kind of that's what you're describing? What do you think God's purpose is in establishing a church? Stay connected to the kingdom, to promote the kingdom, stand on the truth, promote the truth. And they can strengthen one another. Iron sharpens iron. That's right. And we can support one another as we have difficulties and burdens. And it's where God can lead us, right? In particular, with having a, like a prophet upon the earth, is he's able to give us guidance. Like, for example, yeah, the concept of transgenderism wasn't covered particularly extensively in the Old and New Testament, mm -hmm. right? And so, from that perspective, it might seem that God has been rather silent on the subject. Also, right? God did say God is not the author of confusion. I mean, cutting up your genitals and becoming a girl when you're. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree with you. What I'm saying is that. From that perspective, one can sympathize perhaps a little with churches who have interpreted that phrase a little differently. And so that's one of the benefits of having a prophet today, is because we need guidance today. You love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, and if ye have loved one another. So what does that mean to you? You know, show love, spread love. Exactly, spread love. So some people are like, oh, like, he's promoting love, we should love everyone. So if a guy wants to love a guy, that's good, right? Do you agree? No. <laughs> Right? And so and that comes down to interpretation. Well, there's also like other verses where it says a man and a female, like these are like standards that God has. But it also says love and do not condemn. So it is a sin, but don't cast a stone and don't judge. Yes. You can see how it's kind of confusing, right? Yeah. And there's churches who read this and they're like, oh, this is okay because of these types of things. And so that's why it's so important for someone to actually still be talking to God. According to the Bible, you will not find anything, no matter how much you love, that says they're being transgender from not even kind of. So by that logic. Okay. Bruh. Listen, God wants to save everybody, so obviously, in God's eyes, he wants male and female. Yeah. But he's not going to cast stones at that. He wants everybody to be saved, so he's not going to go up to that person and be like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. He's going to draw them in and correct, and over time, get rid of their sins. There are all these different paths. They're all Christianity. You got Baptist, you got Catholic, you got whatever. All of them are different. And then there's one path that says that we still talk to God. That says that God still has a prophet that tells us specifically what he wants for us. Every other Christian religion in the world, no matter what your views are on any of like gender or anything, no one can point to scripture and say, this is where it says you shouldn't be transgender, because it doesn't say that. But also, like I said, it says, God is not the author of confusion. And like just being a male and a female is not confusing. It's simple, it's basic. And God wants that. But God wants love as well. And he doesn't want you cast in stone. So exactly. it's not okay, but you're not supposed to go out of your way. Be like, that's not okay. Well, the point is that people see it differently. And it can be hard to see where the core is, where the path is, and, and where people may have veered off. Why prophets are so important, for example. Now, what we've, what we've got is you've got the restoration here, where God again calls a prophet to reestablish his gospel. Now, some might say that all of these guys are the core and the middle of the path, and that this guy's the branch. But at no point has the new prophet been the branch. Every time he's been the core, he's established the core. But that could also set up for the Antichrist. Like, you see how there's a new prophet, mm -hmm. and then this could happen again, and there could be a new prophet, and there could be the Antichrist who leads everyone astray. That's, that's, that's definitely true. a possibility. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why the scriptures say, you know, beware of false prophets, but then it immediately goes on to say, but test the spirit, right? And that's why we're not just talking yeah. about, oh, here's a new prophet, you should believe him. Mm -hmm. There's a new prophet, you should ask God if this is a prophet or not. The only one who can confirm to you from God that this is indeed the prophet is God, and will testify is the case, is that this isn't the branch, this is the core. Mm -hmm. This is the main path that has been the path from the beginning and will be the path when the Savior comes again. What I'm suggesting, and stating outrightly, is that anything that's not the path is a branch. There's a lot of Christian churches that baptize people in the baby, right? And there's a lot of Christian churches that believe that you don't. Mm -hmm. So if I were to ask you, what's, what's the answer? What's right? It's I mean, there's no scripture I don't, I, that I know of. If we were to go right now, page to page through, through the entire Bible, you're right. There is nothing that says in the Bible about it. It's very clear that except the man born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so that's where, in the Book of Mormon, it actually talks about it. It's, 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 it's amazing. And it goes exactly with what you said. Do me a favor, please. Get out of here. Get out of here, man. Shit, I'm saying. But there's so much that's beautiful about what the Book of Mormon reveals about God's path. It's not that it adds to God's path. God's path's always been God's path. It's been there the whole time. God's truths have always been God's truth. The only thing that changes is how much of it we understand. God's truth remains constant. It's our knowledge of it that varies. Not only in what we know, but how accurately we know it. The Book of Mormon adds to God's truth. I like to say that the Book of Mormon adds to our knowledge of God's truth. I'm fly with me. Personally, that's how I feel like deep down. I just can't force it. For me, I would just rather stick to the, the original copy and just stay to that. And I do believe the Book of Mormon, it is a good add-on. You don't believe in what I believe. I don't really believe in what you believe in. But there is respect because we're with Jesus. I mean, at the end of the day, we're saving people. And you know, if I'm incorrect, somebody could be like, you're wrong, but you have led me in the right direction. For somebody coming to you, they'd be like, well, that's wrong, but you let it, like, you know what I mean? Like, we're all leading people in at least the right direction. So it's not evil, it's not wicked.
the enemy loves to lead you astray. The devil loves half truths. Mm, right. Because there's no power in a half truth yeah. when it comes to God. It's the full thing. Even if, you know, sometimes it hurts. Because <laughs> even myself, I'm like reading the Bible. I'm like, I don't know if I could do that. This is hard. Because when you're a Christian in the world we live in, people will start to show their tail and their horns. Mm. And you constantly have to turn your cheek. You constantly have to forgive. And you always have to be in a state of self-reflecting, which is hard. So it's easier to reject God in this world than to turn and lean on God. I've had so many moments of like, man, do I really want to keep leaning in? And that's why my connection with God is good, because I constantly take my issues to God from struggling to press in even more. I've had moments where I'm like, am I willing to die for this? Yeah. I see the state of the world, and I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm turning away. Turn back to the world. But it says, if you turn away from God, you will go to your own destruction. But if you lean in God, that is where you will be saved. And so, yeah, there's a lot of crossroad moments. So what process do you use to try to determine whether what you're reading or listening to is true or genuinely from from God and not necessarily like the words of Joseph Smith or the mm -hmm. words from the Joseph of Witten, yeah. where they are half-truths. Like, in what way do you try to distinguish from half-truths and full truth? I guess just the Holy Spirit, like really, mm. mostly just prayer, fasting, and you can kind of recognize the truth when you tap into the Spirit. I don't know, sometimes I could even be deceived, fall to temptation or half-truth or be led astray. Yeah, and so for those people who are maybe following a, a half-truth or following a way of life that that is not directed at the way of Jesus, um, how would you go about redirecting? I, I, I'm thinking of like the how we're called to repent, which just means turn from our ways, turn from the way that we're doing things, turn the way from our beliefs and the way that we're operating, and turn back to, to God. So how, in your understanding right now, would we go about helping people turn from the way that they're currently doing things? It's kind of a choice, and I'm not going to say that choice is easy. Even I battle with it to, you know, pick up your cross, really follow, be obedient. Like, sometimes I'm like, man, it's a lot of pain. <laughs> sometimes it's a lot of pain, and it's just like a crossroad moment. But you always pray to God. You always lean on God instead of turning away. Like, we're going to have a lot of issues and a lot of crossroad moments and a lot of fear, anxieties, and God says, cast all your issues upon God. So whatever you're struggling with, if you have fear of going to the next level which we all do just pray to god and he will restore you give you strength or it's kind of like subconscious how you operate what do you mean by going to the next level getting deeper in your faith which can be scary sometimes it requires more sacrifice yeah it requires sort of more more discipline it requires more energy from us in order for us to i guess connect continue connecting mm -hmm. and there's a an interesting cycle of well at least in my life and my experience of where i'll feel as though i'm um, very structured in my faith very connected and then uh, drift away and feel less connected and less like you were saying connected to the truth and it's uh, often a slow separation but there's uh, like a wave that is happening and i think this is where having other christians in our life helps lessen that wave and lessen the extremes where it's then more of a shallow wave rather than these high valleys and low peaks helping out with youth group and, and going to youth group growing up you were able to sort of observe whether that's people your age or the people younger than you uh go through these peaks and valleys of experience and these experiences really dictate the connection individuals felt with God and with Jesus. I think by having Christians around us, we're able to maintain maybe those peaks longer or and, and come out of those valleys quicker. But in that time, we're able to reflect on why are we in these positions? Why are we experiencing this elation of, of being connected to God? Or why are we experiencing this maybe depression, being feeling disconnected? Mm -hmm. And coming out of those, both those things, I think we're then able to return to maybe a, a constant that is the truth and that is the way of God and see this is what I need to be doing and where I need to be in life. So it's like coming out of that depression, coming out of those low points, coming down from those high points, meeting back at sort of base level and doing some more work in not only our own individual faith development, but also how are we uh, sharing that love with those who maybe don't have that hope that Christ offers or those other Christians who are at the moment in one of those peaks or valleys. Billy Graham, he said, sometimes I feel Christ so closely I could do a jig and sometimes I don't feel Christ at all. Mm. And he's like, maybe that's when Christ is the closest because he's testing. And I like that, I was like, whoa. Oh, I want to tell you, there are times that I feel Christ so very close that I feel like standing up and dancing a jig. There are times that I feel like shouting hallelujah. And then there are other times I can't even touch Christ. I don't even feel him at all. 
My mother is here tonight, and I remember when I was in school, I wrote to her one day many years ago, she's forgotten. And I said, Mother, you know, for the last few weeks, I haven't been able to get anywhere in my prayers, and I don't feel Christ. And she said, Son, you have accepted Christ as your Savior, and whether you have feeling or not, the moments that you don't feel anything are the moments when He may be the closest, because that's the moment that you must walk by sheer faith, and God may be testing you. That was nice. But sometimes it's like you don't feel him. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's disobedience. Like maybe you need to press in more. Listen, I don't know. Maybe he's taking it. I'm not God. I don't even know, honestly. I had something, but it's gone. So I think of the story of Job where God lifts up his protection of Job and allows Satan to have Let's his test. way with Job's life and yeah. essentially destroys everything that Job held dear and love then there's that despair that really comes through and even joe's friends are of no help and it doesn't matter how much comforting or explanation or justification there is mm -hmm. on behalf of god but we are in that those depths we're in that those dark nights and then yeah you're right i think that's where at least in the christian tradition where christ offers that hope of of redemption, uh, healing of recreating all that is broken and healing everything that is separated from God. Sometimes when you're close to a breakthrough, that's when the enemy will try to deter you, really attack you, really press in. Listen, the enemy is smart. <laughs> Once you figure out his tricks, something else comes and it's more advanced. More temptation, more urges, more whatever. Like, it's smart. There is definitely, like, a lot of low points and God will almost strip things away just to make it evident that you need God. Whether it's idols. Like, if you're leaning on something, if you have a crutch that takes the glory or takes the power away from God. Sometimes they'll kick that out of the way to where you're like, God, why? Like whether it's, you know, you go broke, and you're like, God, why? That's your idol with me. Sometimes I idolize YouTube. Like I'll go on there and I'll vent and I'll do my prayers there instead of taking it to God. Sometimes we have these idols, I guess. How would you say um, we can identify what our idols are? Your coping mechanism, whatever you lean on, your replacement for prayer, maybe therapy, maybe whatever you rely on for your issues. Like if you have anxiety, depression, if you have these issues, you go to some certain thing. A lot of people, we go to these things. For example, I've identified some of my crutches. One of them is like video games. When I'm uh, just really exhausted, feel down and out, really easy to go just to, to play a video game and uh, turn off your brain for a little while. But as a result of that, I'm not being uh, as good of a husband, as good of a friend, as attentive to the gifts that I've been given in my life that actually have greater purpose. And, and I think there's a, a risk in Christian circles to, well, let's remove all leisure, let's remove fun, because because then it's not helping us focus on the greater mission of spreading God's word, spreading the love of God. And uh, I think there needs to be a bit of balance there. Work and times of rest. Right? Yeah, exactly. Rest is very important. Because if you're running on empty, then you're running without God. Because God is balanced. People who rest or people who take time off trust God that he will compensate them. Like they mm. trust God more. Because if you're overworking, if you're doing too much, you don't really trust God. You're trying to do it yourself. And you need to rest while you go through a lot of things. You need to go to the secret place refill your cup get some new oil get some new fire when you feel drained when you feel depleted sometimes you just need to rest in his arms like when things are hard or when you're depressed or when you have all these issues just take them to god if you need the rest pray about it without season always just constantly talk to god pray to god without season like about everything always take it to him if you're in a situation where you have anxiety and you're fearful or you can't do it like naturally like pray about everything god is supernatural and we are natural so he'll add the super to the natural before God, I had anxiety like crazy, just about ridiculous things. Like, I would be scared of literally nothing, and I feel like a lot of people are. I'd be scared of nothing. I'd wake up and I'd be scared. God says, the righteous are as bold as a lion, and the wicked flee from nothing. And I was sometimes fleeing from nothing. Like, I was just all types of messed up. What you see now is just what God can do. I don't have anxiety. I don't have fear because I pray about it. Yes, I have fear. And sometimes I have maybe anxiety when I'm reaching a level or something, but it's prayed about and it's healed. And I do have issues, but it's all prayed about, which restores, which heals. Because when you're not with God or connected to God, the enemy has complete free roam over your life and he's the father of lies and that's what we're experiencing in this generation is just attacks in the mind of lies, of doubt, of fear, of anxiety, robbing purposes, robbing time and it's a lack of connection to God because God truly renews the mind. He says do not be caught up in the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind and that's why God's important because he will truly renew your mind so you can have the strength to not have this fear blocking you.
you to not have this anxiety blocking you so you can chase your purpose and so you can have strength doing it with all the trials. Life throws a lot at you and if you're not with God, you will crumble. But yeah, don't let fear overtake you because that's what the enemy will do when you tap into your calling, when you advance the kingdom of God. The enemy will constantly spread fear, like all the time, whether it's people, seeds of doubt, like don't do that. The devil tempted Jesus with the whole world, money, all of these things, but in return he was going to take his life, his purpose. He was going to steal everything that truly mattered. Give him everything that really didn't matter. So when you walk with God, gain everything that truly matters, and the devil will try to you tempt that. you and give these urges of, oh, this is better, the world's better, these temptations, these desires. It is really straight and narrow because I see like a lot of people online who are Christians and they go through like a bunch of spiritual attacks. Like it's not easy. Then they start to be overcome by the darkness and you see their videos like get dark and kind of manic. The darkness we walk through every day, it can become a part of you. You can become it. I grew up in church, my grandpa was a pastor. Hope Nate doesn't go Hollywood! So you gotta stay close to God. What part of that do you think is uh, a result of maybe popularity or money for those really popular, let's say, YouTubers or content creators who are Christians and who have hundreds of thousands of followers or millions at times? It's a big temptation, it's a big urge to yeah. switch over, yeah. And so I'm even thinking of like mega church pastors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Is scale inherently dangerous to the Christian faith. I think of Jesus with his 12 apostles. He had a really close-knit circle. And so in our modern context, where we're able to amass tons of followers, or it's just entertainment, or provide um, a service to, to millions, is that something that we should be really pursuing? Let's say we have the gifting, have the skills to do that. At what cost should we pursue that? It's definitely difficult because the bigger it gets, the bigger that can be an idol. Even myself, sometimes I have struggles of idolizing YouTube because that was my old self and sometimes it'll creep up. Like sometimes I'll throw my own agenda, that urge to have my own agenda and come with my own things instead of put Christ first. You have to focus on Christ. The more you advance, grow, reach your calling, the more temptations, the more urges, whether it's, you know, entertainment, the thing to make that an idol will start appearing out you have fans, now there's girls, and now you have that temptation. Like, it all grows. Satan grows as the kingdom grows. And the temptations, the urges, it all gets stronger. And you really have to connect and stay as close as possible to God. Because <laughs> this is Satan's world. Like, you see these girls in the gym and they're half-dressed. Even when I'm working out, like, they'll just be prancing around, like, trying to gauge my attention. I'm like, nah. And just, like, you see how Satan has influenced this world and throwing out temptations, desires, and it's all about the body instead of the spirit. Solution. It's not easy. Just don't go to the gym. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's my solution, you know, just don't go to the gym. It's it's bad place. No, it's kidding. not that, but I notice every time I go to the gym, like some thicker chick will start walking towards me and try to grab my eye. I'm like, Yeah, that's Satan. Like this is so ridiculous. What's your purpose then? You're aware of these distractions. You have these challenges and you're navigating what your own faith looks like and you're reading the Bible lots and in prayer. Where has that led you to what your purpose is? And then I'll also, where are you finding your community that support you in that? When it comes to community, I'm always just so like hyper conscious of the devil. I'm like, oh, hey, he wants to get close. He wants to masquerade as light. He wants to get close and create something. And then he's... But sometimes I'm hesitant of like being a part of communities. Like obviously not you. It's hard yeah, to Yeah, it's trust. hard to be vulnerable. Yeah. It's hard to trust people. Maybe a false thought in itself is that people are out to get you. People are uh, antagonizing toward you. I think it is really hard to find find community, but I think the thoughts of, well, if I am vulnerable with this group of people and they backstab me, then all is lost and I've been betrayed and uh, there's been no point of me trying to enter into this community. If that happens, big if, then you'll have grown from that experience. Yeah, you'll, you'll be able to see what are the markers of unhealthy individuals or unhealthy groups. Is there a group of people within this church who are not following the way of God and who are merely following the culture of Christianity. And the more you enter into that vulnerable place and possibly get hurt from it, hopefully the more you'll develop indicators on, oh, okay, this is something that's not very healthy. This is what this behavior or this type of language can transform into. And then hopefully you'd become someone who shapes and finds other individuals who are searching for 
healthier relationships. Every person should be connected to a church. I guess I'm just like kind of waiting for the realness. At this point of time, it's mostly just relationship. A lot of the times like religion can snuff out that fire, can snuff out that spirit, that holy spirit. When you say religion, you mean like the organizational structure of faith? Yeah, you're overly connected to the world. Sometimes you gotta be on the outside looking in to where you can truly like bring that spirit and then you bring the spirit, show what God truly is. See the issue with churches nowadays, that's where the enemy loves to be. When you bring the truth to a church, you know, it's said in the Bible that people have itchy ears and they won't be able to tolerate sound doctrine in the end times. That's why these mega churches are so famous because people love to surround themselves with teachers who fluff them up or who make it sound good or make it sound appealing. But God is about conviction. God's words pierce. And I'm not saying I'm never going to connect to a church. I definitely will, but I yeah. just don't feel that right now. Yeah, I think it goes back to like what is true, how do we determine what is true, and then what are we using to judge other people within those churches because I think I think it's really easy and I, I'm not necessarily super intimately connected with a church right now just the nature of working out a Bible camp I uh, am busy through the whole summer so I almost take those months off of church and it's hard to reintegrate but with that said it's been easy for me in the past to go to church and have a similar thought and and I grew up going to the same church all the way till I went to college and coming back to it I'm like oh this church is dead and dying and it's there's not much life to it and there's a few individuals who are like that that little light in the tunnel but for the most part it's not bringing life sure we could write it off as this is where Satan likes to hide this is where uh, deception can it can lie wait for us. That's the structure that, that we've been called to, that Jesus has called us to. And maybe our modern versions of it aren't very accurate to it. Um, but then I have to ask myself, am I doing more good for the universal church of Christianity to disengage from that entirely? Or am I doing more good for it to be within it, be amongst people who I disagree with and don't see eye to eye with and think are uh, deceived in some ways and shape it in that way by asking questions that maybe are challenging. At least for myself, that's where I hope to find myself. And I know it's difficult when you have different desires. I'm just thinking to the degree that I would like to see a church involved in the community, uh, participating in like a social gospel. You can tell when somebody's a man of God, like they have that glow. I went to this one church and I was about to get baptized. There's this one like righteous dude, just had some glow. And I feel like when you carry the presence of God into a church, it's like headhunting season. It's dominion, right? Like Satan has dominion, God has dominion. And when you go up to these places, it's headhunting season. There is unclean spirits in the church. And if there's no conviction, if it's a watered down gospel, there's no deliverance, you're not casting out demons. The demons are there. If it's a half true and it's not convicted, church sometimes it makes you feel satisfied with your sins. You feel good about your sins because they kind of sugarcoat it and you're like, leaving the church, it's going to be okay. It's going to be good. It's kind of just like a fleeting moment. You truly need that conviction to feel the presence of God. Whichever way you can feel that conviction, whichever way you can build that relationship, whichever way you can feel his presence, whichever way you can get that oil, whichever way you can get that fire, go in that direction. Anything that waters it down, anything that snuffs it out, man. What can you do? You live in a shoe. Then some people I've heard feel closest to God when they're doing marijuana or doing other drugs. I don't even know if doing marijuana is the right way to say that. Doing drugs or drinking alcohol or spending money. They claim that that's when they feel as though, oh, this is this is God's presence in my life. And so I think it's it's challenging for it to be written off or to proclaim that our connection is almost like emotionally based. Like I, I'm just thinking back to the beginning of our conversation where it was like, how do we know if something's true? And you were kind of saying, well, where are we feeling it's true, right? Um, so I, I'd be hesitant to go that route, mostly because it's really easy for our emotions to deceive us. A breakdown on emotions and what emotions are. Emotions are unstableness. Emotions are double-mindedness. It's when you have one foot in with God, so you may have these holier-than-thou thoughts of peace, of joy, of love, of the right thing that you should be doing doing in life and you have one foot in the door with Satan, these negative, disturbing, destructive, depressing thoughts. That's what emotions are. It's a wavering between good and bad, faith and doubt, love and hate, peace and anger. And when you feel true, pure peace, there's no deceit, only God, because that is God's language, truth, love, and peace, the fruits of the spirit. That is where God dwells. And the more connected you are with God, it's not emotions. It's not just a scatter of weird things popping inside of your soul. It's a constant soul feeling that is undeniable. And I feel like 99.9% .9 of Christians have never felt this. They do not know the God that they even 
serve. They don't know the God they actually serve. Yes, they go to church on Sunday. Yes, they can read scripture. Yes, they can correct you day in and day out, but they don't know the God they serve because they idolize the church. They idolize being a Pharisee and shoving scriptures in your face, but God is a God of connection and intimacy. And the more intimacy and the more connection you build by applying, not just reading, by applying and being obedient, the more you will feel God inside of your soul. And it's not emotion. No, it's soulful where it's constant. It doesn't waver. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding that never leaves. It only grows with the more obedience, with the more you dive into that relationship. And it's crazy how many spiritually dead Christians there are that have never experienced this feeling. It's because they have connected themselves to Christian organizations, Christian groups, the church, the activities, but they never took the time to connect with God. And God says, if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. So if you're a lukewarm Christian, there is no relationship. There is no presence. God has spit you out. Get deeper in your faith. Build that intimacy. Build that relationship. Go to the secret place fast. Get to know the God you serve and not just the activities, not just the people, not just the services, not just the things that surround God, the external things of this world that will pass away. Get to know the God you serve and be obedient. Apply his word. Take some time out of your day to read some scripture instead of reading Instagram captions. I think it's good for us to to look at our faith, right? To to. Yeah, but are the people in the church really abiding by God? Are they really applying that scripture or are they reading scripture? And that's the difference. You know, you get the connection by applying the scripture, God's word. We could read all day. We could be in a church reading, singing hymns all day, but it's about obedience. God knows the intentions of your heart. He knows you. And that's where you feel the presence when you're obedient, when you apply the scripture. If you're around a bunch of people who are reading but not applying. I would agree. And if you're applying and you're carrying your cross, you're in a different direction. You're not in it like listen you may not even be in that church you may be doing a purpose or what god has called you I listen to my chest i feel it in the wind i know that i'm obsessed that's how i'm gonna win yeah i train for this yeah i pray for this i didn't change for this i was made for this